Okay, welcome to this session, uh, Modern Identity Management in the Era of Serverless and Microservices. And before to start with this subject, I want to ask you if you know this company, Equifax. So I will do, right? Um, this company suffered in 2017 a big uh, cyber attack. Uh, and I will show you a little bit of statistics, but this is a customer credit reporting agency. Th so that means that they really handle a lot of sensitive information of their clients. Uh, and well, uh, since the official reports that never are all the bad things that happened, just a few ones, they say that they have been uploaded uh, fake information around like 38,000 driver license and 3,200 password details. But they also uh, have stolen a lot of information. Uh, and here I have a, a little bit of statistics of all this information. So it's around like 146.6 million names and dates of born. Also, 1,045.5 million social security numbers, 99 millions of address, and 209 million payment card numbers and expiration dates. So this is really, really uh, sensitive information that now the cyber, uh, these hackers can use for create, for example, fake identities. That is something, uh, a big issue in the United States. Uh, identity stolen for other people. And what happened with this is that this is a security issue. Like Equifax have nothing of security. They don't save anything encrypted in their database. The databases were not in masked. They don't transfer the information encrypted from the database to a backend. And the backend well has a, a host, right? So it's really important that we add security to our systems. And my point here is that, as usually, the first point of break of a system could be the logging. Right on here, uh, right now, we have the European Union. Last year, we received a lot of emails of places that we don't know uh, with upgrades to uh, privacy policies or creations of privacy policies. But now, if we make things like Equifax, uh, we will need to pay a fee to European unions for make those things run. And part of those things are identity management, so how I handle uh, the information of my identities. And well, finally, I want to say to you that security is really a team effort. What happened in the development industry is like you talk with developers and they say, I don't get that because this is the responsibility of the security team, of the security guy of a company. And maybe sometimes we don't have any security team in a company or a security experts. It's something about us. And we need to add security in all the entire cycle of our implementation. So we need to take care about that. And which one will be our ag agenda? So we'll be a little bit... Uh, Biggest, so we will try to achieve everything in the time that we have. By the way, the, the timer is not working, so yeah, if not, I will continue. It's, oh my God, I continue having 15 minutes. Okay, so we will start speaking about uh, REST API designs and what things do wrong some developers. So I bring this same talk in uh, many sites around the world, and this is something that continue being happen. And I will talk to you a little bit about JWTs. Maybe someone of you listening that before. Then we will talk about the user credentials problems. Then I, we will define where is identity management and where is identity and access management for improve all this cycle. And then I will show to you a few of questions that we need to make before to start a project about how to have a successful identity management. So these are things that are usually anyone make before a, pro a project. When you say, okay, we need to have users in the system, okay, don't worry, you copy the login that we make in the other project, and we are done, but maybe it's not just that. So we need to take in mind more things. Then I will talk to you a little bit about how identity management is related now with architecture like microservices or serverless. And finally, I will uh, introduce to you, if you don't know then, the identity as a services. There are a basically platform as a services that we can use for delegate or our identity uh, cycle. 
So my name is Mercedes Viz. I am, uh, I am from Guatemala. I live in Guatemala. I did and work there. Uh, I also have a community leader for uh, Google uh, Technologies uh, community that is Deps Plus 502. And I run a J Duchess chapter that are the female uh, Java communities. I also was a member of Guatemala Java Users Group. Uh, we want to uh, Dux Choice Award in Educational Outreach. Uh, in nowadays, I am CTO in a startup based in Guatemala, and I am Oracle Groundbreaker Ambassador and Out Zero Ambassador. So, let's start with this. So, what happened with the bad API designs? So, we have uh, REST APIs, right? Our bucket. And one of the problems that we have is that people for make all the authentication and in the, the authorization process, they require that always send the username and the password in every single request. So basically, in each request, people are making an authorization, an authentication for make the validation of that user. And this is a wrong approach. The first thing is that so we are forcing the client side to save this username and passwords locally. Because we will not ask to that user uh, introduce the username and the password for every single action that they will have in our system. So one problem here is that usually clients don't save that in the correct way. Indeed, uh, if you don't believe that, but uh, here are Starbucks, yes or yeah? So uh, Starbucks have one of those issues a few years ago in their mobile applications because they were saving the username and the password in the applications in a plain text, in a, I don't know, a Starbucks.txt, and there was the username and the password, and anyone have access to that uh, file uh, because they were sending all the time the username and the password to the REST API. So if you don't know uh, OAuth, how many of you listening about OAuth? Yeah, many of you. Exists other standard too that is called SAM that works for uh, the, this approach. So what established OAuth is that we will have a client app and now we will introduce this OAuth server, or an authentication server. So our client app uh, will send uh, the credential of the login to the OAuth server. So it's request and access token. Not always will be sent a username and the password. We will talk about that after. And they will validate these credentials for make the authentication of the client. So if that credential is correct, they will return a token to the client. And now the client will save this token. Of course, not like a Starbucks in a TXT file, if not in uh, better ways, right? And then always that we require something to our backend, we'll send this token. And the backend will establish a communication to this authentication server, this is the authorization process. So if this token is correct and the user have permission to access the result that he want, so they will return uh, an answer and then the backend server will return an answer to the client. That is, thanks for your participation or this is the information that you want. So for that is uh, now uh, the most common approach is use JWTs. Not all people like to use JWTs in that sometimes uh, we have clients that want to know what happened in everything. And one of the things that happened with JWT is that you can see the information that is traveling in a JWT. So some clients don't like to use that. Uh, in this uh, same standard exists other that is called JSON Web Encryption, the JWE. I will not speak about those ones, but these have a huge of encryptions that we can use so anyone can see the information inside that. So where is JWT? JWT is an open standard that was created, uh, well, finally created in 2014. Uh, and some guys say we need to use the power of JSONs for transfer information in an encrypted way. So when we see a JWT, we are watching something like this. We have a header and a claims. Something that happened with that is that anyone can take this token, watch the information inside, and modify that information. So we combine the JWT standard with a JSON web signature for a signature. So if the people modify or something modify the information in my JWT, when I say this JWT will not match the signature with the information that I have in the JWT. So we have some algorithms for using the JWT. And <coughs> So I will not speak much about this, and we will explore a JWT. So this is a JWT that have a signature. We have the headers, the claims, and the signature. And this is something encrypted. <coughs> I like to say that, but when I say uh, that we don't need to send all the time the username and the password, so that people say, yes, so I will 
put here the username and the password inside the JWT, and this is not what we need to do. We need to uh, stop to using the username and the password. So only the user know that, and only the database will have that. And any other thing in our cycle of the system will have this. So here we have this. This is a claim, the subclaim. This is the one that is user for identify which user or which identity is represented this token. Could be the username or could be other kind of ID that we create in our system. Uh, this is other interesting uh, claim. There are the scopes. That is when I define which permissions have this user here. Or I can uh, make a comparison of permission inside the database. We can use uh, both approach. Other things about that is this type in the header. I like to say that um, because sometimes when we are creating a system, all the parts of the system can be developed in different programming languages. For example, if I have native application, I can use for iOS a Swift. Now I can use with Android Kotlin. I can have a backend uh, with Java or with wherever else. Or I can have a frontend in Angular. And I will need for example, a library for each of these ones in different ways. And what happened with the libraries is that when this claim type always is JWT, some libraries avoid the use of this uh, claim. So sometimes uh, validate that, others ones not. So when I interchange tokens between the both systems, they will say reject a token just for this claim. So we need to be careful in choosing um, libraries for handle JWTs. So these are some uh, registered claims that we have in the system that they say are really useful for us. And one interesting are the JTA, that is the unique identifier of this JWT. So I can establish it that one JWT will be used just once. So I will create a unique identifier, and I will save that in the database, and I will uh, validate if this identifier was used previously or not. So if I receive a second request for this same JWT, I will reject uh, the request. The next thing is the sub, that is for identify the, the username. We have this of the is, the is the issuer of the token, so I can uh, put here who in all my system was the one that created this token. And I also can have a, this expiration is when I have a session times that I need to respect or my token only will be valid for an amount of time. So for a go finish in the, this section of the JWT, so we can use not only for make authorization and auto, an authentication, that is why I'm trying to say to you, but we also can use them for feder create federated identities, uh, make information exchange between two clients. Uh, we ca also can use them for save information in client side session, that is when I am sending, saving things in the cookies of a browser. So since the people can make inspect in the, for example, in Google Chrome and watch the cookies and modify the cookies, if we use a JWT, we avoid to the people can modify this information or have client side secrets. So just for a stay uh, in the same page, uh, we have a client and we have a server. So where is the authentication and where is the authentication process? And I will tell you then what I will explain you that. So when I am making the login, this is the authentication process. So I am saying I am this entity in this system. And the authorization process is when I am required if I have permission for consume something. Um, in this same, uh, well, in a different talk, but sometimes people believe to the authorization process is when I, in my client, restrict which permissions have a user. So that means which things I will show to them and which things I will don't show to them. But for example, in the website, something that users or people can do is see all the endpoints that I have in my website, and they can access directly to an endpoint in day when I they don't have this option in the, in the client side. So finally, they will get access to that if we really don't verify if they have permission or not. So if you want to explore more about JWT, I suggest this jwt.eo website or read this handbook uh, that had more examples not only about authentication and authorization, even not how you can use them for implementing federated identities or client side sessions. So now we have an improvement of our API designs. So now talk about the user's credentials problem. And this is not about only users. Sometimes it's about us as developers, right? Which, which password do you put in the server? Admin, admin, or QWERTY. This is other famous that we use, right? So one of the problem with this 
is not precisely that people use this fake password. It's like we are only using the single signing on as the only login options in our systems. So if we know that people create fake passwords and in that all create fake passwords and those can be stolen to our system if we don't put any security like Equifax, we continue using that. But what happened in the technology industry, they say, we will solve this problem, and we will force users to create safe passwords. And what we do? Create rules. And happen things like this one. I don't know if it gives you time for read. I think that in the back can read, OK? The OK, this guy finally created the password one, two, three with you uppercase P, right? So this continue being a fake password, but it's matching all the rules. So what happened is that say we need more harder rules for our systems, for me that they don't create this fake password that match the rules. And then we go to systems when happen things like this one. I will show you, just that guy take the picture. Good? So this one, right? You know, to me, happen all the time with one system. So always that I access to that system, I never try to make the login. I always go directly to the reset password, and I put wherever because I know that will be the same story in the next uh, access, right? So this is a problem, right? So try to make to the people create secure passwords is not the solution to that. Because then people cannot uh, remember each password because it's something different in every system. Or people use the same password in all the system, that is the worst part. So how we can improve all this and make this safer? Uh, not only improve this, so I will uh, speak to you about other things that we need to take in mind for handle our users. And the first thing is, define where is identity management. So when I have a, a project, the identity management is not only permit to my users make login and everything is okay. So it's an entire process. So this is an umbrella term for we have the three things. The first is make provisioning. We need to make account management or all those identities and we need to have an identity governance. Uh, some things that happen in nowadays uh, in more enterprise systems that were migrating to new things or in that in the past when we start to creating uh, mobile applications is that the people don't have this concept that we will have a backend and we will have have some clients, and we have many systems to the website was uh, connected to this same backend. So when we make the, the web, the mobile application, people say, oh, what we will do now? And what happened in those systems, for example, banks make that. You can access to a website in the bank for see your products of the bank, and you have a mobile application for see your products, but you have different username and password for access the website and for access a mobile application. And is that for them are two different systems and they create two different ways to handle the users, right? And we can create uh, only one system for handle all the users and make to this website connect to this system and the mobile application connect to this same system that is handling the users. So uh, provisioning is when I have entities of the world and I will assign identities to them inside my system. So these identities are the ones that can make login and have permissions to access things inside the system. And we need to think in different ways about an identity that we make an authorization and an authentication process than an actor of my system that have assigned things inside and we navigate and we can sh show his information. So we need to divide these two concepts. For that happen these things that have some banks, right? One username and password for the website and other username and password for the mobile application. And the next thing that we need to take in mind in, uh, well, more modern projects is that we don't have any more only physical people accessing uh, our system. So I don't have only human beings using graphic user interfaces for access my system. I can have robots to uh, interact with my system or IoT devices or the new voice user interfaces. So I need to have a system prepared for all those ones. The next thing that we need to take uh, in mind for that is the account management. So it's not just have a username that have a user ID that can be an email address and the password and if it's active or not. If we have a log that you handle uh, 
uh, blocking of users or not. So how I will maintain all those identities throughout all the life cycle of my system? So how we will secure this information? Uh, you will not believe there exists a lot of systems when you enter to the database and you can see the password of every user because anyone encrypted this database. So anyone that accesses the database can see that information. Um, then I am saving, for example, uh, sensitive information to those users, to these identities. So if I am handling uh, sensitive information in my system, I need to encrypt that information. And this is what happened to uh, Equifax. They didn't encrypt any name. They didn't encrypt any uh, directions, you know, any address. They didn't encrypt any information on the databases. So, what happened with those uh, hackers that entered to that database? They say, okay, we have a credit card. And maybe they have their, do know, this credit card has a limit amount of money of $50,000. So you say, oh my God, if this guy have a credit card limit of $50,000, that means that he has money. And in that, he has that address to this person. So you see how kind of problematic can be that. So this is now a target to people that can make a, uh, bad things to them. Uh, it exists other kind of uh, sensitive information. So we need to choose if we will encrypt this information or if we will use a database that mask all the information or if I will encrypt in the backend side the information and save the information encrypted in my database. Uh, also, things that uh, usually people don't think about that uh, is this because they don't think that this of the identity management is an entire life cycle, is that what happened when uh, they raise their accounts or what happened when they is no longer inactive. So we will talk about a little bit of that in advance. And finally, we have the identity governance. So if I will create a system, uh, an identity system that works for many systems, so how I will uh, define the groups of users of identities that I have for access this, or how I will handle the permissions. I don't know, but a long time ago is that permissions really are dynamics. In that when a system say we have roles, but uh, the roles always are something uh, utopical in, in systems. So we need to define how we'll handle permissions or which systems I will uh, handle in, in my identity systems and how I will permission to all these ones. Then we have the identity and access management. Then they, this is the place when I define how I will permit to my users make an authentication how I will make the authorization, and if I will create an identity federation for me to all these child systems can make access to these identities. So in this case, for example, I will have an identity system that have an identity federation in, in the back. So the website and the mobile application will use this identity federation for permit to the users use the same credentials for access the same system in two different places. So the easy one is the authorization, right? This is when, when we receive a token that can be a JWT or wherever else that you can use. And I will uh, verify that is a, a, this is a token uh, created by my system, is properly signed, it is uh, defined for a user that is really a user in my system and it has permission for the things that they want to access. This is something called a for right. So if the right individual accessing the right results in the right times for the right reason. So then we have the identity federation. Uh, and how many of you use Facebook? Yeah. Well, we, we laugh because we use Facebook, but you go to other places that they don't use Facebook. They only use Twitter. You know? Yeah. But I, I know that feeling. Yes, yeah, of course. All of us use Facebook. So. We have this Facebook, I don't know if you something enter to the Google Play Console or the iTunes, um, any one of that has a special name. So for Facebook, the normal Facebook is called Orca. It, it, this is Katana, sorry. And this is the Facebook Lite. So if I don't have a much resource in my cell phone, I can uninstall the Katana and install the Facebook Lite. So I also have the message, uh, Messenger that is called Orca, and this is Messenger Lite. Then we have here is Creator. This is Pages for Handle, uh, the fan page in Facebook. Uh, this is, I think, so Announcements. Uh, and we have moment, Announcements, Moments, Analytics. Uh, I don't remember this one. And this is the App F8 that is uh, for the event that uh, Facebook made, like Google Leo or Java one. Well, Good one now. So all this application, what happens if I will have a different username and password for access each one of these applications? 
crazy, right? I handle a fan page, for example. So all them, we use the same credentials. And something interesting is that I can have installed the Facebook, and when I download the Messenger, I don't need to make again login. The, uh, well, if you use a Messenger, you know that we only open that, and they make some verification. Say, okay, you are uh, logged on it. They say, are you this guy? So for example, to me, as are you Mercedes? And you say, yes. And they permit to me enter to the system. So my point here is that they are using an identity federation. How many of you make a login or a register in other system using Facebook? Yeah, all of us. You say, oh my God, thanks to the gods, blessings to these developers. I don't need to create any username and password for this. So I am using the identity federation of Facebook. So Facebook have this, and many, many systems can use this identity federation for permit you, uh, other users can make login and register to their systems with the Facebook credentials. So this is about identity federation. Make all this. I will not explain you how to make this, just uh, a little bit of how works that. So in the beginning of the World Wide Web, um, only one domain, in this case, we are talking about related domains. So in the example that I was using of the um, banks, we have here the web application of the bank and the mobile applications of the bank. So this domain make the login, for this user make login in the website, and the token was saved in the cookies. But the website, for example, the mobile application, we don't have access to those cookies because we are not created for this one. So the people say we need to create something that is a federated identity. They call it that way. So that means that one domain X that is related with a G domain can have access to the same cookies for uh, obtain the same information. So they created, in this moment, was when it started to create this uh, conception of the authentication server, the OAuth server, the identity provider. So we have a customer that make communication with this identity provider for obtaining a token, and then our service will communicate with this identity provider for validate this customer. And now we end with uh, something more crazy like this. So now we have domain one. So in Facebook, this could be Katana, and this could be Orca. And we add here the OAuth server. So the domain, the user will make login here, but the domain will have that communication with the OAuth server. When the OAuth server uh, make this uh, properly, is this one uh, save the, uh, the token here in the cookies. So, uh, and return this to the, to the domain. So when the domain two came and asked, you know, uh, this user is uh, login before, they say, OK, let me check validate in the cookies. And they say, OK, yes, we have a token, and this is the token for this user. So for example, if we are in, the, in a website, and I have opened my Facebook, and I enter to other applications that say, OK, you might to make a login with Facebook, and we make that, we enter automatically. If they ask to us the credentials, this is, or they implement in the wrong way the Facebook authentication, or they are stalling to us the, the credentials. Because this is, if I am logging in the same web browsers in Facebook, they don't need to ask me the, the credentials. So I never make login in those websites because are suspicious. So this is what we know that when we make a logging with any other things. But in this case, we are talking that I will implement this uh, federated identity for provide my systems use the same way to make logging. Then we have the authentication section. Uh, and here is like when we are only using single signing on, right? It's like copy the login to other project and everything is OK. But we can improve this one. The first improvement is uh, make a little bit more complex the logging. So we will make login with something to the user know, something to the user have, and something to the user is, right? So and here is when we make the, uh, the normal login, username, and password, and we require today uh, introduce a token that can be these ones, and now we have a mobile gen token generators, right? Then we can use, for example, in a, Cell phones, these of the face recognitions that sometimes are failed things, right? Because you can put a picture of someone and will detect that is that one. Exist libraries that you can require to the people move the face or they open and close the eyes. And we have to the fingerprints, and this is what we know as multi-factor authentication, right? 
uh, make or two steps verifications and works too with uh, SMS. Doesn't work if we travel much and we don't have rooming. Uh, and well, in that sometimes, uh, in that when you have a uh, rooming, the SMS not don't arrive always. And also, this is other uh, implementation. Uh, this is uh, an app that is called Guardian. So you make the login here um, in the website, and that will generate a QR code. And you have uh, an application in your cell phone, and you will scan this Q QR code with your application. Now, you will register this website uh, in the website some handling for a uh, Guardian. So this is just for register the website. And then you need to go to the application for allow permission to the website. So all of us were students in that university, right? And we go to the university lab for see our Facebook. So how many of you uh, forgot close your Facebook session in a lab? Someone laughed, right? So what happened is like you leave and someone, oh my God, someone have his session open. And they put you that you are a boyfriend or girlfriend to someone else, they post, things, really bad things in your, <laughs> right, in your fan page. So imagine that Facebook works with Guardian. If you remember that you forgot to close the session, you can come to Guardian and say, I will uh, deny permission to this website. And so Guardian will make that in the website. The next thing that someone tried to do, just close because you denied the permission. So it's a little bit of more steps, but you have more power over your session. Then we have uh, biometrics, right? So we have this of the fingerprint of the facial recognition, but we can make that uh, more harder. Uh, this sounds like a military technology, but really exists make uh, iris or retina recognition. We can make in that uh, voice recognition. This is something that we can do, for example, with Tilio. In that exists type recognition. Right now came some uh, cell phones that uh, detect with your type recognition. So if someone else takes your cell phone, they say, you are not the owner to this cell phone. Or we can make a uh, DNA uh, recognition. So like la moda in. The Incredibles. So how many of you watch a Supergirl? No? Yes. In Supergirl, uh, pass a, a chapter in, in the season, in one of the first seasons, when the bad mother used Lena Luthor because she needs a real Luthor uh, ADN for open the one door. The next thing that we have is uh, passwordless. Passwordless really means permit to users make the login without a password. So here are one example. Sometimes this is combined with a passwordless solution and where exists uh, a password saved for in cases when the user cannot use that. So this is a, a flow for a company that want to give the users, their employees, um, the facility to access fast to an application when they are in the office physically. So the first thing that they are validating is if the P e IP address when the employee with access to the, uh, to the application is one IP address registered in the system. So if not, they require that make a multi-factor authentication. The next thing that they use is health fences for knowing if the user, the employee, is really in the office or maybe they can register the house of an employee. So if he really is working in his home. So if these both things are uh, match, they will permit the access without any introduction or a username and password. If not, they will require always a multi-factor authentication. The next one is use the fingerprint. That this is something that we can use with um, websites or with cell phones that can read uh, fingerprints. So since a fingerprint is unique for every person, uh, we can use that in there as a username. So in this case, we are reading the, the fingerprint and we are validating this one. So if this user exists, or, or that means to the, if the fingerprint exists in my system, so I will generate a token and I will return that to the user and is login. If not, I will uh, create this user in the system and make again the generation of the token and the user is properly signed. The next one is the SMS codes, right? Uh, for example, Google use sometimes this approach. So all the time that I will make login, they will send me a token or a code to my cell phone by SMS, and I will introduce this one um, to the system. Here is something important because people not always is allowed to receive SMS, and sometimes the 
the telcos that provide the SMS doesn't work. So it's not fault to our system, if not to our SMS provider. So here, the people really need to create previously a password for kind of make access if the SMS doesn't work. The next thing that I suggest here is like ask, uh, like in the credit cards, that people introduce this uh, cell phone that they will receive the SMS code and validate if it's the cell phone that we have registered in the system. Because maybe they change of cell phone and never actualize that information in our system, and we send a code to other cell phone that they don't have. And the final one here is the magic link that is sent a link to a email address for, a, for they may click and they may log in. Uh, how many of you use Slack? Yeah, many, right? Slack is like for the mobile application, they use this of the magic link. So I introduce my email address, they send me an email, e email uh, for a link in an email, and I click in the Link in there also I can uh, make a login in all the workspace that are registered with this email. Uh, the, next, the next thing is use uh, social federated identities. So it's not only about Facebook, we have more options. And we need to validate, depends on what uh, things are using the people, which op options we will offer to them. So for example, uh, if we are relating with things of pays, maybe we can uh, offer to them uh, PayPal or for things like uh, Related with corporation situation, we can use LinkedIn. I don't know if here works uh, Amazon, no? But you know Amazon, right? So for example, in, in United States or in some places here in Europe, uh, we can ask something for Amazon, but they don't use, uh, they don't have a, a courier properly for Amazon. They hire other systems. So they give you a token for make the, the tracking of your or your package. So when you go to those systems, they say, okay, create an account, and they permit to you create an account with your Amazon credentials. So this is just for you show that. So how we can have a successful identity management project? So one of the first uh, issues is don't believe to this identity management is an entire cycle. So people are usually never ask nothing. So the first thing that we need to ask to us is how we will uh, users will be create an account. Sometimes I am, uh, for example, when companies came and said, you know, we want that you create this system. And this is something that, that someone tell me, you know, we made that. And the guys create all the identity management platform. And at the end of the project, the company came and said, no, but we have our own identity federation uh, for handle all our users. So this is what not needed. We need that you incorporate our identity federation in the project for handle all the identity users. Other thing is that we are uh, migrating legacy applications. So we need to take in advance if all these uh, users will be synchronized for other uh, application. So here we need to take in mind something really important is that these passwords in the best of the scenarios are encrypted in other systems. So I can migrate all the passwords to this system, to my system, or I will require to these users restart a password. So this is something that you need to ask. So the next thing is will be our username uniqueness. We really will use the email address or we will demand to the user create a a username. So I will put an example. Exist systems that permit to us may login with several uh, federated identities, like Facebook, uh, Gmail, LinkedIn, GitHub. But for example, I can have the same email address used in these four ones. But those systems permit to me have a different uh, account. If I create one with the GitHub, this is an account. If I create an account with the Gmail, this is other account. In that one is the same email address. So what I do in those cases is create a different uh, username. So these are things that we need to ask before. The next thing is that we really need uh, so. Will users will use the login? So I really need to put a single signing on or not, or which other options I will offer to them. The next thing is what devices will be used. Uh, many systems don't have a tracking uh, of in which devices do you make a login. If it was a Chrome or a Firefox or a Safari, or if it was a mobile application, an Android, 
or an iPhone one. And never save a tracking of that. So how you can detect anomalies in a user. So we noticed that you always make login uh, for an account, but now you are making a login for a Firefox. So some system sent to you uh, an email alert saying, we detect this one. Is you or is not you? And the other thing uh, about that is if I will permit have uh, two sessions open at the same time. For example, in Facebook, I can stay connected in a Chrome, in a Firefox, in a Safari, in my Android app, in my iPhone at the same time. But sometimes banks applications don't permit that to you. So if you make a open a session in, in the mobile application and you were the session open in the website, they say to you, we will close your last session for security. Uh, the next thing is that we really need single signing on and we can offer to the users other options instead of that. The next thing is that we need multi-factor authentication or this is, so maybe we are not handling any really security information. So what happened when the people make logging out? So I am saving things in the cookies. I need to uh, clear these cookies when the people may log out or I just close the session and I forgot all the rest of the things. And it did also happen in the mobile applications. The next thing is how uh, browser configuration uh, have influence of that. I have a website that I make login, but I always need to make a uh, logout properly. So for example, if in that moment my computer make <laughs> and everything death, they save the cookies, and then when I try to make login again, they say, you know, we have a problem, this is a bad request, blah, 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 and I cannot make login. Um, I need to clean all the cookies. Well, a normal user will need to clean all the cookies of his browser for clean that and can make a login again. So I know that I can make uh, inspect and clean just the cookies of these websites precisely. But this is a problem. They don't handle in the properly way if happen uh, wrong situations in a website. The next thing is if I will have a session timeout. So can I have a permanent open sessions like happen in Facebook? How I will handle the permanent open sessions? For example, I will renew the token after every request or I always will be used the same token. So for example, exist systems that renew the token every six months. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that is, but they made that. So the next thing is uh, the provisioning. What happened when the session is over? So that means when I decided close, close a session. And here we need to take uh, care, especially with the GDPR regulations. And one of the things that happen is that people can make illegal things in our system. So for example, Facebook is one of them. And other that I like to use a lot is the porn uh, website. Yes. So some developer need to make that, right? Uh, so what happened if someone is selling their uh, child pornographic? So this is something illegal. And they came then, sell information, and they just erased the account, and this is like never happened. But this is our evidence, right? So what happened? So you know what happened in your country? They discovered that you permit that some people make illegal things in your systems, or you have a privacy policy that talk about that. So it's like a, maybe if the people erase an account, you need to wait a time for erase all the information, and you need to say that to them. The next thing, and this is really interesting, is the password reset, right? Sometimes I don't remember my password, and you came to a website, and it's any recovery password, any reset password. It's like we forgot that. We only put the login there, and nothing of that. The next thing is how we handle the blocked users. So this happened for a situation like Netflix, for example. How many of times you will bring to people for don't make a payment before to block the user? Or right now we have this in the social media, like Twitter or Facebook, right? When someone is uh, saying, you know, this guy is uh, making improper things, and they say, okay, we will block your account during 10 days, during 15 days, during 30 days, because you are making things that are not uh, right. Then it's anomaly detection, and this re is returning to this aspect of uh, how devices we will use. So we need to detect for when a person is not accessing to account in a place that is normal for them. So for example, always that I am making login in other part of the world, I receive an email that say, you make login now in Sofia. So it's you or it's not you, because two days ago you were making login in Barcelona, right? Those things. Or 
yeah, you are using a new cell phone. So this is a new Android cell phone that we detect. And you say, yes, finally, I brought a new cell phone. So yes, was me. So we need to make this detection. The next thing is the privacy and compliance requirements. And this is interesting, is that you really have a privacy policy in your system that define how you will handle the information of your users, that you define how this information will be used for other people, that define what will happen in some cases. So how many of you listening of the scandal of Facebook? Yeah, which one? <laughs> the Cambridge one. Yeah, that was in 2017. Yeah, it's that grand, big, big picture of, of uh, Mark Zuckerman taking water Yeah, this is the picture uh, in the other side of the coin that he has like 20 um, journalists in front of him taking pictures. Uh, but by the way, everybody say that this is full of Facebook, that Max Zuckerman is making things run. The truth is that Facebook has a privacy policy. And all of us sign this fucking privacy policy when we are starting to use Facebook. And we receive a uh, notification of the privacy policy, what actually I said, uh, you want to know more, and we just click in the X. No, I don't want to know nothing. And you know what happened with Cambridge? It's like all these games in Facebook, like, oh, see which uh, character of Game of Thrones are you? And yeah, yes, I will play this. In Cambridge, what happened is that they have a game that say, I will tell you your percent of female or male that you are. And the people were playing that, and they say, we need access to all your entire profile. And you say, yes, take permission to all my entire profile. So people was giving permission to that people to access his information. So the fault of who was that? To us or to them? Yeah, it's a, a combined, right? But yeah, many systems don't have these privacy policies. Uh, now, for example, Google Play, if we have an application, Google Play forces it to us to put a link to a privacy policy. So unless you need to create something in the middle. Um, the GDPR, uh, will, you will pay fees if you don't have a privacy policy. This is other one for developers. Say audit logs. What happened in the logs? Oh, I say I will print all my JSONs in the logs for see what is happening. And the people print the JSON of the login with the username and the password in plain text. Yes. So at least we need to encrypt the password, right? Or put asterisk, 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 right? But some don't do that. So if someone have access to my logs, we'll have access to this information to my users. So consider identity information can change over the time. So uh, what happens if I if I'm handling my information, the, the state of a person, so it's married, single, divorced, or whatever, and I never offer to these users a way to they change this information, so I need to do that. So what the fuck have all these things to do with uh, serverless and microservices. So the first part is like what things we need to make for improve all this process for users. But now uh, we will return to this of the REST APIs. So now basically microservices and serverless were a way to improve how we develop these REST APIs. Instead to have a big monolith, I will not explain where is serverless or where is microservices. I hope that you know or other one explained that. So we have this thing here. And we always have this authorization and authorization process. So now in, the, in this new approaches of microservices and serverless, we have a new frame that is the API gateway, right? Because I can have uh, the microservices in different services. And they will have a different endpoints that we need to access. And what we want to do is the client just have one endpoint with last names. This is how I call that for access my system. So now the API gateway will be the one uh, on charge to handle that communication with an identity provider. So that means the handle the authentication. Well, the authentication is the client direct to the identity provider. All the authorization process will be handled in the API gateway. So the API gateway will receive the token. We validate if this is a valid token. And until this is done, 
will pass to the microservices. So the microservices will not make this job. Also happen too in the serverless uh, architecture. So again, the client will be the one handling the authentication process, then we send to the API gateway this token, and the API gateway will validate if this is a properly signed token, and then after that, we will call our functions. So our function never will run if, if the authentication is not correctly. And before to pass to a few demo, we don't have much time for implement all those things because sometimes the problem is like how I will implement all these identity management approaches in my system. So we don't need to do that. We can use an identity. Oh, oh wait, this is my fault. Yeah, there is. Uh, we can use an identity as a service. So systems that made that for us. So the Famous clouds have that. We have Azure Active Directory, Oracle Identity Management, Firebase Authentication. Uh, in Amazon, we have Amazon Cognito. A Google Cloud Service don't have a, their properly identity as a service. Um, instead to make all this that, they make a partnership with Auth0. Uh, in the Java ecosystem, one really famous is Okta. Yeah, you know Simon Ritter. Someone came to give a talk. He, he works in Okta. Yes, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, with two people, I, am five. I don't know if someone raised a hand here, but yes, good. Uh, we have this other we as O2, but exists other, a lot of uh, identity as a services provider um, in less uh, companies. So now I will make a few demo using Express Gateway. So I am creating a token in an out server identity as a service. Um, I download my key, uh, a PEM of the key when I am singing these uh, JWTs, and I will verify to this token that I am receiving in the express way with is properly signed with this uh, PEM key. And I also have a, a coding a platform called WebTask that is for uh, serverless. So I use WebTask because we don't need to put any credit card for make a test of serverless there. So we have restriction that we only can handle one request per second. So I cannot have requests uh, simultaneously. So I will quit this. And we have here, this is the, the function that I have in uh, WebTask. They have, for example, this is my endpoint. If you see something really ugly, so it's better to use other ones. So, this is my Express Gateway. Uh, we create an Express Gateway project with the NPM. I also have in this uh, folder uh, my key, the pen when I am signed the JWTs in the OAuth server. Now I will explain you what I have here in my uh, gateway configuration. So the first thing that I have here is that establish that I will receive my request for HTTP. If I are by HTTPS, I use HTTPS. And I am uh, saying that will be for the 9000 uh, port. The next thing that I do, do is create my API endpoints. These API endpoints is the endpoints that will handle the API gateway. So in this case, the express gateway. So I am calling that mother IDM. I am putting this an asterisk, so that means that I will not validate any uh, domain. So could be hostname, could be uh, jprime.io, whatever. And my path will be this hostname plus mother identity management, and I only will accept requests by post. The next thing that I do is create my service endpoint, that is the serverless function that I will point. And I am calling that to a mother IDM, don't need precisely have the same name. And I put in the URL of my function. The next thing that I will define is all the policies that I will validate in my API endpoints. So I am defining this of the JWT and a proxy one. The, the proxy is a for set for everything. Now I have the pipelines when I am defining all these rules for every API endpoint. So uh, here I define it, the API endpoint is the mother IDM. And now I will uh, define the policies uh, for the JWT actions. I am defining that I will a secret or public key file, and I am saying, where is this public key file? And I will don't check if the credential exists before. The next thing is have a proxy. So I will have an action that is the mother IDM. This is my server's endpoint. And I don't will change this origin. So now I will go to Insomnia. Uh, we don't have uh, more time. So here, uh, this is for test um, 
is something like Postman. I think that this is a better way to explain that. Postman is really, really no way. So first I will make a send here, and this will say to me that I have a unauthorized uh, permission. I have here in there a token, but this is not anymore a valid token. So I will came uh, here, uh, obtain a token, so this is my project in uh, out zero. I will don't go to there, but I have here some uh, things that I need to send to them for uh, obtain a new token. So I send to them, and they send me a token. So I will copy this. I don't know. I there is. And I will come to the validate token and I will paste this in my header. There is. And I will quit this. Now I will send this, and we will receive the message that we are sending in the function. Yes? So, okay, thank you for coming. I hope that you enjoyed the talk.